Hello. Um, welcome. On behalf of the New School and the Verilis Center for Art and Politics, I'm really delighted and thrilled to welcome you to the Public Art Fund Talks at the New School tonight with Anish Kapoor. My name is Karen Kooni. I'm the director of the Verilis Center for Art and Politics, a public research platform and forum for art, culture and politics, and the only one dedicated exclusively to mining the intersection of art and politics. Um, for close of half of the Public Art Fund's existence, the Verilis Center has been the host of um, these programs here at the New School, and it's been a really um, incredibly important part of our programs and a great pleasure to collaborate with the Public Art Fund in programs that merge our institutional um, commitments and interests, um, among them an understanding of the urban environment as a campus, as a studio, or a commons, where the Public Art Fund's commitment to art in public space meets the Verilis Center's embrace of art as expression of specific political moments. And tonight, of course, I'm thrilled to have Anish Kapoor here. As I reflected on the talk, um, I remembered naturally my first encounter with a work by Anish, physically a very small um, funnel, a black funnel, mounted on a museum wall in Switzerland, but metaphorically a black hole, deep and dark enough to swallow uh, the sorrow of the entire world. The complexity and beauty of um, Kapoor's work um, have achieved something that I think is usually reserved for or applies only to truly momentous uh, events, like say a, um, the election of a president. I expect, I expect you as well remember, will remember or do remember that one moment when you encountered for the very first time an Anish Kapoor. In a talk in 2015, Kapoor asked if beauty and politics can be linked. He then proceeded to answer affirmatively, spelling out that both are putting demands, very specific demands, on the now. And such a sense of urgency is certainly called for in our contemporary um, political moment. I think it's also what accounts for the quality of a momentous event that the installations of Anish Kapoor have. I'd like to thank the Verilis Center's advisory committee that supports our programs. I'd like to thank uh, my many um, colleagues at the New School, and of course, um, I'd like to thank Anish, but also the Public Art Fund for 12 or 15 years of um, collaborating with us on an incredibly important program series. And um, I'd like to acknowledge particularly Nicholas Baum, the director and chief curator of the Public Art Fund, who is now offering a proper introduction to Anish's talk. Thank you both. Karen, thank you for those warm and kind words. It's wonderful to continue our long-standing partnership with the Vera List Center here at the New School. Uh, it's exciting to see this wonderful full auditorium uh, for, I think, what will be a very special occasion here with the niche. This is, in fact, the, the final talk in our spring season, and what a finale. Anish is here having just opened an extraordinary new work, Dissension, in Brooklyn Bridge Park. And uh, I hope many of you have already seen it um, and will have a chance to see it very soon. This, in fact, is our 40th anniversary year, and I uh, want to take a moment to thank very much our 40th anniversary presenting sponsor, Bloomberg Philanthropies along with our leadership circle, uh, including Elizabeth Pepperman, the Howes Foundation and David Schumann, as well as uh, uh, Anisha's longtime representatives, Gladstone Gallery, Listen Gallery, and Regan Projects. This year is an exciting one for us. Um, Liz Glynn's work is currently at the entrance to Central Park. Spencer Finch is in downtown Brooklyn. Anish is now in Brooklyn Bridge Park. Katja Novitskova, the young Estonian artist, is coming to City Hall Park in June. And Ai Weiwei coming uh, later in the fall. Plus maybe a couple of surprises, so stay tuned. But these projects reflect our core values. Free access to great contemporary art for everybody 
and seeing the city as an open platform for creative expression. In this digital era, we also believe in first-hand experience. And you'll see images of Anisha's works tonight, but they must be seen in the flesh and heard and felt, as you'll discover when you encounter dissension. And this is also why we invite artists to speak, so you can hear directly from the source and perhaps even pose a question at the end of the talk. Anisha's career began around the same time that the Public Art Fund was established, really a germinal moment in the late 1970s when artists were thinking about and experimenting with art in new ways. He's become one of the most important and influential artists of his generation. That's a term that's thrown around often, but in Anisha's case, it really is true. Um, and he continues to work at a sustained level of innovation that is really rare. His accomplishments are too many to list, but I'll give you a few basics. He was born in 1954 in Mumbai, India, as a student, he moved to London to study art where he has lived ever since. He's shown in museums and galleries all over the world, also creating a number of major permanent installations, including, of course, uh, the extraordinary Cloud Gate in Chicago. He represented the United Kingdom in Venice uh, at the Biennale in 1990 and won the grand prize the following year, he received the Turner Prize in London. In 2003, he was made a commander of the British Empire and awarded a knighthood in 2013. <laughs> this year, I'm not finished embarrassing you. Um, this year, Anish was honored with the prestigious Genesis Prize, committing the $1 million award to help alleviate the current refugee crisis. <laughs> uh, recent museum exhibitions have taken place in Rome, Mexico City, Moscow, Seoul, and even my hometown, Sydney. When you think about it, not bad for an immigrant from the colonies. Anish. Over to you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Karen. I'm, I'm very aware of where I am. I mean, this place and what it stands for. So I'm going to start with this. Um, modern bourgeois society, with its relations of production, exchange, and of property, a society that has conjured up such gigantic means of production and of exchange is like the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld whom he has called up by his spells. This, of course, is Karl's, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, and I think uh, Communist Manifesto, 1848. Of course, it's precisely in that place between the means of production and the dark arts of the sorcerer that the artist lives. And I think that's key. So what I want to try and talk about is ritual, because clearly the arts of the sorcerer are ritualistic. Um, there are two basic ritual materials. One is blood, and the other is earth. And they are completely political, both of them. And I think, even though I'm not a political artist, I'm deeply interested in um, how we negotiate um, the space between those two. On a small reflection, one can see, of course, that blood is paint, and earth is sculpture. So, I've always thought of myself as um, the sculptor who's a painter or the painter who's a sculptor or something like that. 
but the negotiation between the two is important. I'm going to dwell on blood for just a minute, please, before I start talking about the work, because I think it's important. Um, of course, blood essentially is female stuff. Um, we all have it, but it's female stuff. And in um, menstrual um, solidarity comes the first idea, I think, of um, the denial of labor, I mean physical, the, the act of sex, of course, um, but the denial, the, 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 the coming together and the denial of um, um, corporation. So that's, of course, deeply political. Um, it's also linked, inevitably, to the moon. So that also makes it cosmic. And the struggle, and one might argue that the first acts of culture are the acts of women in solidarity painting their bodies with um, red ochre um, in order to dance and show that they are one. Um, all we can do as men is try and assume that, so that, that power. We assume it by having, by acts of initiation. Well, there are two. Acts of initiation, which is basically cutting yourself. Um, and the other, of course, is hunting. Um, but I love this idea that somehow, in acts of blood, there is transformation. Um, my mother's Jewish. So I was brought up in a Jewish household, kind of. Um, age 16, my brother and I went to Israel um, from India. It was deeply shocking. Um, and I went through a very, very difficult period. Um, my mother decided that the only way to deal with my difficulty was to bring some earth from India and put it under my bed. Yeah, but a deeply ritual act. Um, one that, at the time, I found confusing and terrifying. Now, um, under the bed, of course, dark earth from India. So this is why I bring earth and blood, um, because they are fundamental um, materials of ritual. And I'm going to try, in a way, without being directive, because I'm not really interested in that, um, to explore some aspects of what I've been trying to do through these lenses. Um, this here is a work called As If to Celebrate, I discovered, discovered a Mountain Blooming with Red Flowers. It's made of pigment, as you can see. Um, and um, it's a ritual. It's a laying out of stuff in this particular way that um, confuses the problem of the object. Um, pigment is, is weird stuff. It's um, both physical, material, factual stuff, um, and yet has this illusory, I'm not here quality. Um, so somewhere, again, between, I, I'm going to say, between liquid and solid. Um, so I continue to explore these, these, these works for a while. Um, another one, white sand, red millet, many flowers, as if performing a ritual. Um, um, laying these works out was, was curious because um, it's as if what I was doing was composing a, a, a process, composing a, a space between objects. Um, I began to feel that composition was not really where it was at. Um, that, in fact, one could um, act out the space between objects and the events of the objects themselves, um, but that they weren't absolute enough. Um, I'm looking, I, was, I felt I was looking for something else. Um, um, if you like, through ritual and beyond it. 
um, pigment is also rather like, um, because I, I lay it out and it's, of course, on the floor, it's rather like, these objects are rather like icebergs, sometimes above ground, but mostly partially relieve, uh, um, um, partially above ground, um, something, something invisible, something hidden away, something underneath. Um, the non-object as much as the object on display, emphatically on display. So, the space between objects, composition, oh, I, be, I just got tired with it. I felt that um, um, even though, you know, as I reflect back on them and look at them, I think, mm, they're quite beautiful things. But I wondered about this, this idea of, um, um, of singularity. Um, is, it, is it possible to, to make something um, that goes beyond the object. So um, I came up with this, a work called Descent into, Descent into Limbo. Um, it looks like a hole, but it's not a hole. Um, well, it is a hole, and it's not a hole. It's a, it's a space full of darkness. It's, it's painted a very, very dark blue, um, which makes it feel as if it's a thing on the floor. So w when I made this work, when I first made this work, uh, this is Document uh, 92 or something like that. Um, of course, you make a room, close the door, and there's a line. Um, people waited for 45 minutes or, or whatever, there, a long time to, to go into this room. There was a, a man that went into this room um, after waiting for a long time and was absolutely furious. How could it be that, you know, I do lots of things in the name of contemporary art, but how could it be that I'll wait in line for, for um, so long just to look at a black carpet? <laughs> so in my terms, total, total success. He was so angry, this man, that he took his glasses off. He must have had cheap glasses and threw them down a the hole, or threw them into the piece. Um, and when he saw that his glasses disappeared, um, he became so terrified that he hugged the wall. Like, oh my God. Well, of course, the sublime, if, if that's what it is, is dangerous. You know, the Kantian idea that um, 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 you'll fall, that fear, fear and, and, and darkness live with each other. There's a work called Adam, um, a similar idea of, you know, a hollowed out stone um, with a dark interior. Work called Dark Brother. Um, anyway, I'll go on. So in the early 90s, I was really interested in the way that architecture um, can be explored through surface. So, I mean, this is a space with a, a crack in the floor. Um, and of course, it's a, it's a dark interior. The, the point is that the, that the interior needs to be dark enough um, to be terrifying, otherwise it doesn't work. Otherwise, it's just aesthetics. I, I remade this work recently in Cuba, and we opened the show the day Castro died. Um, of course, we didn't open the show the day Castro died. Um, and, and that was, uh, that, yeah, anyway, I'll tell you that story another time. Um, anyway. Um, a work called My Body, Your Body, which is, of course, um, um, the fundamental question. Um, these works, if they're about anything, um, if they point to anything, um, it's an idea about, about the interior, um, about darkness. Um, I'm convinced that, of course, this thing that we, we call our bodies, um, we know of as our bodies, doesn't define us. Um, there's something else. Um, interior. We're much, we're much other than just this physical, physical object. Um, and I think looking for that space um, is important. It's as if the inside is bigger. And I think sculpture proposes the notion that the inside has other realities. Um, so here's a, a work called um, Void Field, a series, I think there are 16 blocks of big blocks of stone, which are all hollowed out and have just a, a, a little dark aperture. Um, again, 
the insides bigger. Yes, there are lots of ways to explore this idea than I have. There's a mother as a void, this one. Um, this is a work I showed here in New York at uh, the Guggenheim called Memory, um, uh, made in two different spaces, one where you view this and the other where you view that. Um, so one is, of course, the inside of the other. And it's strange how small shifts like that um, can cause one to, to, to have to um, rethink the nature of the object. And that, that, that I think, is what I'm really after, um, the sense that that is the same as that. Um, sculpture allows this wonderful play, I think, between um, real and unreal, between the, the, the object as a, as, a, um, as a physical full thing and um, the illusion of it as a half thing, as, a, as an almost not there thing. I laugh at myself sometimes, but anyway, um, this is a work called Gabriel, made, made um, of course, Archangel Gabriel, um, made out of earth. Um, I put it here because I want to bring earth into this, into this story. Um, of course, yeah. And another work um, called She-Wolf um, in the studio. Um, I showed this at Barbara Gladstone's ga gallery here in New York um, a year or so ago. So, um, I used to have written on the studio wall um, that there's no hierarchy of form. All form is possible. Um, so I began to explore the possibility of making sculpture, making objects without actually ever touching anything. Of course, I'm deeply interested in the auto-generated. So, um, ritual implies hand. Ritual implies that the body takes part, but what happens beyond ritual, or what happens if you like, if there's ritual in spite of um, the body. Um, the idea being that the object manifests itself, just in a way as we condition our own sense of ourselves as being, well, I was always there, I'm always there. Um, um, death is hard to imagine. Death is hard to, 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 to even give any, anything other than fictional presence to. Um, so, what of auto-generated objects? What of objects that make themselves? So, I, I worked with a, a, a friend, and we uh, invented a machine that just printed these objects. That you know, we did a few little. I did a few little sketches, and then um, the objects kind of made themselves. Um, um, scatological and, but there's a huge amount of form in it. And I, I'm, of course, deeply interested in form. Um, a work called Gagu Ma, um, using the same idea. And another one. Ah, the healing of St. Thomas. So this is a, a Fontana-like, um, um, cut in the wall, um, thinking of architecture as bodily, as a, as a place of the self. Um, you know, Thomas's hand in Christ's, in Christ's wound. Um, and then, when I'm pregnant. So this is, this is a white bump. Uh, these are works from the late 80s, early 90s. Um, there's a white bump on a, on a white wall, and it's extraordinary that an object can both be and not be. Um, so, in a way, very similar to a pigment piece, but um, 
I feel I managed to somehow step out of the problem of composition. Um, you know, I, I've never believed in the idea that, that uh, you know, that thing over there and that thing over there have some wonderful relationship and it, it, it matters. Um, somehow, I know a lot of artists work like that, but I can't. Or at least I don't feel that it, that it, that it goes to that, that uh, deep place. Um, so I'm trying to find singular moments. So this is when I'm pregnant from the side. In fact, Nicholas, I was in uh, Australia when um, visiting the Olgas, which is uh, air, near Ayers Rock, uh, the most magical place, if you've, if, the most deeply religious place I've ever been. So if, if, if you feel like that kind of thing, go there. Um, but, and this, I, I must have seen something that made me think of a white bump on a white wall. Um, yeah, so back to ritual. Um, this is a work called Shooting Into the Corner. Um, I'm, I'm basically a teenager, and uh, I was invited to do a show in Vienna, at one of the great spaces in Vienna. And of course, I've, I've always loved um, Hermann Nietzsche, Gunther Bruce, and all those guys. Um, and I was wondering what I should do um, in this space. So I thought, I'm going to put a cannon in the middle of the room and shoot it at the corner. And of course, I've got to shoot it with red paint because reds are or blocks of, of, of red wax because uh, I have a, a long and deep attachment to red blood, don't forget. Um, I then, you know, as artists often do, we are, we are foolish and um, um, it's not for nothing that the the, the paradigm of the artist as a kind of the, the jester is 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 um, is in our in our cultural um, imagination. So I took I, I did it. I took it seriously and did it. And um, um, then all kinds of things began to occur. It occurred to me that the corner is first of all that there's a psychodrama between the the canon and the and the corner, a kind of Duchampian male-female opposition. Um, the corner as a very clear kind of idea about, about architecture and origin, um, feminine, and this aggressive phallic shooting. Then, of course, there's Jackson Pollock and Goya and much else. I would. I didn't think of those things before. They happen after the fact of the work. Um, so I think that's the right way round. Um, I'm not, a, not someone who can sit on a plane and do a drawing in my sketchbook and then say, ah, yes, there's a work and this is what it means. It, it doesn't work like that. Um, I'm a hugely studio-based, I go there every day, I work a regular day, um, and out of practice, things occur. Um, ritual occurs, and I, you know, I wear the same clothes, eat the same lunch, eat the same breakfast, eat the same lunch, do absolutely regular, lead the most regulated life. It's the only way, I think. So all of that's ritualistic, I think. Um, and it's the only way that, that, that um, something else, um, something other can occur. This is a, a work I made in, in, in um, um, oh, I forget what it's called, some museum in, in Berlin. Um, and of course in Berlin it's very, very hard to, to do anything without referring to what happened, what's there, what was there. Um, um, these conveyor belts have blocks of wax on them that just continually fall out. Um, nothing much happens, but it's happening. The wax um, leaks and does 
whatever, all this. I've been, it's curious at this moment to say that I'm, I have nothing to say as an artist. I'm not really interested in having anything to say. Um, but I am interested in process. Um, it's as if um, a process has its own logic. Process is often geometric. Um, process, um, even uh, perhaps even specially when it's an act of decay, um, has a logic and a, and a functional um, geometry that is its own. So this is a work um, called Swayam, which in Sanskrit means auto-generated, self-made. So what I did was cast a, a block of wax. Um, it's a big block of wax. And um, put it on rails and moved it through the building. So it's as if the building um, was kind of shitting this object or pushing it, pushing it out, um, casting it, making sculpture of it, um, turning the negative space of the door into the positive space of the object. Um, so here it is at the Haus der Kunst in Munich. Um, and of course it has all kinds of meanings that emerge out of um, the specifics of the site. This is, of course, the site of um, um, a museum that was built in the Nazi era and the site of the well, one of those Nazi exhibitions. Anyway, look, I'm not really interested in, 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 the, in the, um, the process, but I must say that the meaning changes. This is the Royal Academy in London. Um, A work called My Red Homeland. Now, you know, this is the earth under the bed. I didn't realize it at the time. I don't know why I called it My Red Homeland. Um, but red's absolutely central to me. I've often asked myself, why is red? Why do I keep coming back to it? I think it's because it's blood and earth. Um, and um, Yes, there are many, many works I've, I've, I've played with over the, over the years that um, look, to, look to join up blood and earth. I think dissension that's out there in, in, in Brooklyn Park at the moment is also joining blood and earth. So what happens here is that the arm, the central arm, um, simply moves around. Nothing much is taking place, but it's kind of churning, churning this, this red, waxy material um, very, very slowly. Um, somewhere between geology and biology, or something like that. Yeah. Um, Oh dear, what am I going to say? Um, this is a work called Tarantantara, which is, um, I was asked to do something at a, at a, um, a site in uh, the Baltic Museum in Newcastle. Um, and the, the, the guts of the building had just been taken out, so I, I went to look at the building and um, had this idea about trying to turn the, what was there inside out. So if you stand, um, there, in front of the, the hole, um, and look through the building, it looks as if the whole space is foreshortened to the narrowest part of, of the neck. And then um, there's a little door which you can go in to the interior, and it's a great enormous thing. So space changes. Turning inside out changes things. Um, um, the great modernist adventure um, with form was, of course, uh, what should we say, Brancusi, the rocket, onwards, upwards. Um, somehow my um, understanding of form is that it's converse, inverse, inside out, um, um, the back of the cave, not, not looking out to the mouth towards daylight. It, 
Um, I've been in psychoanalysis for 25 years, so it's, it's that dark stuff under the bed um, um, which needs deep and constant looking after, um, which is difficult, problematic, painful, um, but also deeply demands deep commitment. Um, and I think that's what I mean by ritual. Um, so forgive me if I keep coming back to this, but I, I do feel it's, it's vital. Um, it's the thing we recognize as human. Um, it's the thing that I think we can, we can all take part in. This is, of course, a work called Marcius that I showed at the Tate, uh, the Turbine Hall at the Tate. Marcius is, a, is the myth of uh, the flaying of Marcius, um, Titian's great painting, um, in which um, Marcius, uh, as, um, what did he do? He, he thought, well, he played the flute more beautifully than, um, than Apollo, and Apollo had him flayed. Um, and I didn't set out to make uh, a work called Marcius. I made a work quite formally. You know, these three rings um, stretch across the space. I want to make something bigger than the space. And then I realized that it's a skin, and it's a flayed skin. It's a skin um, with the inside, um, the inside removed. Um, Marcius made sense. So there, there it was. Again, in retrospect, I can see that it's a ritual act. This is a work called Dismemberment, Site One. There's a wonderful Indian story about um, the goddess, the goddess, the primal goddess who dies. And um, the god Shiva is, um, um, who's you know, one of the triad of Indian gods, um, flying around the universe, carrying her body. And as he does so, bits of her body fall uh, in different places. Of course, the most ritually powerful of those places is the place where her vagina falls. Um, many parts of India claim this is where the vagina is. No, that's where the vagina is. But it's interesting. It's interesting. I mean, again, of course, I'm talking about ritual. Um, and, you know, I wonder if sculpture can do that. So it's, this is an object that's about uh, 100 meters long. It's a great, enormous thing. About 100 meters long and about 30 meters tall. Um, um, that's 90 feet tall and 300 feet long. Um, sitting in the landscape, and it's, it's, yep. Anyway, there it is. OK. Um, of course. Interiority, the inside is bigger. Um, this is a work, uh, it's called Leviathan, which I made at the Grand Palais in Paris. Um, the inside is so, three holes, cathedral-like. It's very big. I, I can't remember how big, but big. Um, and then the outside is that. So, so you, I've worked the space in such a way that you go into the object first, and then the next part is in the space between the building and, and um, the object. So it's an inflatable made of PVC. Um, and the reason it does, um, the reason you have the three holes is that the form is net. So the form does that. There's a big bulb, and then it comes to a narrow neck and then forms a nave. And what you see from the inside is the neck. You don't see those big round forms um, until you go in the space between the object and um, the building. It's the best fun in the world to do this, I promise you. Well, what I mean is, of course, that as artists, we conduct our, our educations in public. Um, that's a quote from Barbara Gladstone, who's there somewhere. Um, 
Um, but we do. And the first, there's no, you can't try these things out. You've got to do it. Um, and you only have one go at it. So it either works or it doesn't work. And I think that's, um, the, that's what we've got to do. That's the risk you have to take. That's the, you've got to have the guts to do that and just do it. Um, no model, no, no pre-rehearsal pre, um, uh, of the form will tell you what it's going to be. You have some idea, but anyway. Anyway, another one of these works, and I will move on. Outside and inside. Yep. So, Sky Mirror, um, New York, Rockefeller Center. Um, um, after making void pieces, dark, dark holes and dark uh, spaces for a while, I wondered if Mirror could do the same. Um, not just be reflective. Um, you know, um, there's a long history of, of mirrored objects in sculpture, but um, very, only in science have they been concave. Concavity does something very strange. Um, it isn't a, just a reflective mirror. It's a space full of mirror, just as I tried to describe descent into limbo as um, a space full of darkness. This is a much flatter mirror. It reflects the sky uh, the same. This is the same work that was in um, um, Rockefeller Center, um, you know, in, a, in, a, in Hyde Park in, in England, um, acting like a constable, but with an upside down sky, of course, ever changing. Um, so space full of mirror. Concavity is very, very difficult. Techni technically very difficult um, because it magnifies the surface. So to get it right, if you can see the surface, it won't work. You need to not be able to see the surface, um, just as you need to not be able to see the surface of a dark, dark interior. Um, and not seeing the surface is hugely problematic. Um, um, I mean, many colleagues of mine, or a few colleagues of mine, make positive convex objects that are mirrored, those are already difficult enough. But concave ones are hugely problematic. Um, and it's, it's taken me years and years to understand how to do it. So I have a, a couple of people that I work with, uh, one in California, who, um, bless his soul, has found ways to, to make this happen. Um, Cloudgate in Chicago. You know, when I first made this object, I'm deeply interested in public space um, and public uh, participation in, in, um, in the outdoors, in what is our communal space. This is why public art fund is so important. Um, but when I first made this object, I, you know, there were, it was like this, thousands of people all the time, and I thought to myself, oh dear, you know, Disneyland. <laughs> what am I going to do? Um, so I decided I'd go to Chicago and sit with it. And I went and sat with it. And something weird happened. I realized that the object is hard to name in terms of its scale. It's a big object and a small object. I mean, it's a big thing, but it feels big and small. And that's just for one reason, and that is that it has no joints. So there's nothing to measure your body against. You know, scale, our scale comes from, from how, we, how we measure ourselves against something. Um, no joints means no scale, and that is mysterious. Scale is the same as poetry. It's profound, mysterious, inexplicable, um, and has qualities of um, transcendence, I'm going to say. Um, that are confusing and wonderful. Anyway, I'm gonna show you a few more stainless steel works. This is in Jerusalem. Of course, Jerusalem's the place where you need to turn the world upside down, um, bring the sky to the ground and the earth to the sky, or so they tell us. And um, a red, 
a red sky mirror. This is only a way of leading into this, which is, um, I've been fascinated by water for a lot, of course it's blood, um, but I've been fascinated by it for a very long time. This is a, a, a pool of water that's spun in a, in a dish like this, and weird things happen to it. It becomes one, um, one mass, um, so, and forms a concave mirror. So it isn't water any longer. It becomes something else. It's almost as if it becomes plastic. Um, and I think that, that change, that kind of alchemical change in the nature of material is um, um, one, of the, one of the things I'm after. I think one has to not be apologetic. What's the point of being an artist if you can't have the, absolutely the highest ideals? Um, you know, I'm sure there are a few doctors in the room. You could be the most wonderful doctor and do your work even if you aren't the best doctor in the whole universe. But what's the bloody point of being an artist unless you can aspire to the absolute highest? So I, every time I meet young artists, I, I try and insist, don't do. I mean, don't try, do. Um, it's no, there's no point um, in us aspiring, just aspiring. We have to kind of get there. Anyway, um, this is a, a work. I've been making paintings for a very long time. I'm going to show you a few of them. Um, this is a work called Internal Object in Three Parts. It is uh, um, silicon, kind of whatever. Anyway, I'm not going to say much. I don't know. I'm still making this body work, so I'm, um, we'll see. Um, this is silicon that's mixed up in quite big quantities and needs to be used within minutes. Um, one of the great things the abstract expressionists did, um, one of the things they discovered to do was to never aestheticize, meaning don't look at the object you're making, just make it. And I've tried to follow that principle. Don't worry about what it looks like, just make it. Um, I'm not going to say much. It's clear um, where these are going. Uh, this is the latest incarnation of them. They're kind of wrapped up uh, in, in, in mesh. So one of the things that I think I've understood about um, um, these objects is that it's the object and its shadow. That it's the object, this, what the mesh does, of course, is make the dark space of the object darker or fuzzy or something like it. Um, Dirty corner, that's a dirty corner. In, I grew up in India, as I've just, as I said. Um, India's full of dirty corners, and mostly they're deeply human. Someone slept in that corner, um, or spat in it, or something kind of basic and human. Um, so, and a corner, of course, uh, is fundamental to sculpture. It's the beginning of architecture, um, and the most mysterious space. It's the space beyond. It's beyond the room. Um, so here's a work called Dirty Corner. Um, Versailles. This is this. I'm going to just very briefly talk to you about this. Um, Dirty Corner in Versailles. Um, a big tunnel, funnel, um, with stones, big stones, a lot of very big stones around it. Um, I wanted to, you know, Versailles is very complicated. Le Nort, uh, who designed the gardens, um, 
surely one of the, the greatest artists or whatever creators in, in, in French art history, um, hugely ambitious, but completely ordered. I wanted to do something in Versailles that was going to disrupt the order. I'm afraid I succeeded. Um, so um, early in the, in the making of this, this work, um, I gave an interview in which I suggested that this was the, um, the queen on the lawn. It's not exactly sexual, is it? This thing, is it? I don't think it is. So it's about as sexual as, you know, this glass on its side. Um, anyway, um, it got written up as the queen's vagina. Oh, dear. And then, and then, um, in no time at all, it got covered in just the most kind of vicious graffiti, anti-Semitic, deeply hateful. I decided that I was going to leave it there. So, um, as you can see, it's horrid, horrid. Anyway, having decided I was going to leave it there, I got taken to court. What for? Displaying anti-Semitic material. <laughs> I swear, that is the truth. Um, and, of course, I lost the, the, the case in five minutes. I didn't even, it didn't even have a chance to argue it. Um, I decided I'll be damned if I'm going to remove it. You know, I'll be damned. Um, it was difficult. So I arrived in Paris and um, I had police protection. Can you be, believe a bloody artist needs police protection because of this? Um, and there's something deeply, deeply wrong. Anyway, I decided I had to find a way that was integral to the work to leave the graffiti there and um, um, just cover up enough of it. So I decided to cover it in gold leaf. Um, of course, Versailles. Versailles is all about gold. Um, and I quite like the alchemical transformation that hate can become something else. Um, so that's what we did. OK. Um, oh. So ascension. This is a word called ascension. Um, it's, it's made of smoke. Um, as I say, I, I'm taken by the idea that objects aren't as described. Objects aren't what they say they are. Um, this is a, a work in which the, the air in the room is circulated and um, smoke. Smoke is kind of um, um, here through the floorboards. Smoke's allowed to come into the room. And um, it makes an object. It makes a, a column, a column, you know, rather fictitiously, rather like the, the one that Moses led the tribes out of the desert with, a, a, you know, a desert, whatever you call them, um, um, devil. Um, I like the idea that an object can be made of an immaterial thing, ascension. And that, of course, leads to dissension, so another work made with water here in, in Kochi in India, um, and another version of it, and Versailles, another version of it, and in the middle of the Seine, another version of it. I'm going to show you one more work, if I may. Can you put that other slide on, which is nothing much? I, I read a, it, it doesn't have much of an image, but I read a, a piece um, in a newspaper once about some research that someone was doing about um, spaces that are haunted and spaces that are spiritual. Apparently, according to this person's research, um, those spaces have a resident frequency of a very, very low pitch sound. So I tried to figure out if one could make such a space. You know, um, could one make something that had a low enough resident, resonant um, frequency? 
um, turns out it's 18 hertz, so which is a very long sine wave. Um, so we tried to make such a space. Um, I realized, of course, that it's not about the space, it's about the sound you generate, but the sound is subaudible, you can't hear it. Um, so we made it. And it's, it's like, an, like an elephant um, that generates deep, low sound in its trunk, and it's because the trunk's very long. So we had to make these long tubes. Um, but the weird thing is, I showed this work at, at Listen Gallery. Um, the weird thing is, of course, that it wasn't spiritual or haunted. It just made you feel incredibly anxious. Um, so the work's called Anxiety, and it, and, and it does make you feel very anxious, so anxious um, that people working in the office next door had to move out while we showed the work. Um, but I think by, by talking about this, what I'm trying to say is um, that work makes itself, that there are, that as an artist, what one does is set up processes and follow where they go. So that's all I can do is follow. Thank you. For some questions, if you're Please. game, sure. Um, and Please. if members of the audience would like, uh, so we have these two microphones. Um, so feel free to make your way down, and uh, if you have a question for Anish, can we maybe should we move Please. Uh, Please. to the, the In next the front here, or um... Anish? Did we uh, did we want to? Yeah, sure. Move? Please. Please, so let's, let's show the piece as it is in, uh, in Brooklyn? Brooklyn. Please, please. Do we have the next? Can we do that? Next slide. There we go. There we go. <laughs> um, are we going to pass the mic around, or what, what are we doing? There's someone up the front here. I think or? we're going to bring it How down. How do we do it? Hola. Oh, hello. Hello. It was amazing. You're, you're such a... You're such an artist. Um, <laughs> I'm like, no, it's really, really spiritual and magic and... It's amazing. It's really amazing. Okay, with that said, I discovered your work in Mexico City that uh, last uh, November. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you use a lot, a lot of material. So I just want to know, yeah, like, did they give this for free to you? How you pay for all this material? Like the money, the money ah, part. How you always, do this? Always comes and, to money in the and end. Also, and also, and yeah, ya está, después ya estoy. So how you get the material, how you pay for it, and the waste. Do you get, like environmentally, you think about the environmental, because you think about blood and earth, and you, you, you think about the world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. I don't really know how to answer your question, but um, nobody gives you anything, no. You have to kind of, yes, they do, but, but you, you have to, you, you know, you, you make it possible. The work makes it possible. Um, uh, the wax, if that's what you're asking me about, it's reused and reused and reused. Um, um, I don't know what to say. Um, what would you like me to? So you, so you, you paid for yes, I paid for the materials. Yes, and I try to be um, responsible with them. Thank you. Please. Sorry, Nish, can you repeat the question? Yes, I so the question is, how do, I, how do I go from concept to realization? Um, of course, things start as an idea, or half an idea, or less than half an idea. Um, and 
um, somehow one has to, I, I, you know, I have to feel after dwelling on it for long enough that it's worth pursuing um, and doggedly pursue it. And it's very, very difficult. Um, in Chicago, for example, this was um, 1998, I think. Um, nobody had ever made a, an object that big in stainless steel. There was no, uh, I, uh, I remember a, a meeting in which I did this sort of bean-shaped drawing on, on, a, on a little blackboard. So that's what I want to make. And the extraordinary thing is that it takes two, kind, two people to believe me, and the person who's going to take it on. So in this particular instance, it was a wonderful man in Chicago called uh, John Bryant, um, who um, took it on. And at one point, you know, he, he said, um, we have a budget of $3 million. I said, sure. Um, we went off, and it came back at $8 million. OK. He said, give me 10 days. Maybe you can make it half size. <laughs> so we went, we went, we thought about it, and I didn't believe in half size. And to his credit, he came back and said, no, I don't believe in half size either. I didn't, I didn't say a word to him. He just, um, so we got started. He never talked about money again. It cost many, many more, much, much more than $8 million. But we just went for it. I found this crazy kind of can-do guy in, in, Cal in Oakland, California. And we did it. I don't know how we did it, but we did it. You know, we just doggedly pursued it. And I think that's part of the, the, the process. Um, but there's never enough in these, in these projects um, to be able to rehearse an idea. You just have to jump in and go for it. Thank you. Please, please, please. Hello. Um, so my question is around um, where your fascination with earth and blood began. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just assuming that as an artist, you're influenced by your life experiences. Mm -hmm. So yeah, where did that fascination start? I've, I mean, I've already said at least once, I have nothing to say. And I really do believe that. I, I've talked too much, but I don't have anything to say as an artist. I don't, I don't believe in the idea of delivering a meaning. I think um, um, Duchamp once made a very important reflection on the idea of the, of, on the role of the artist and the viewer, in which he said, the artist is a mediumistic being, but, but, that circuit with the work can only be completed by the viewer. So, if a meaning is delivered, according to me anyway, if a meaning is delivered, the viewer has no role. Um, and it's when the artist perhaps gets out of the way enough and there's a place for the viewer to, to inform looking something happens. So a thing comes into meaning rather than <coughs> delivers a meaning. I think there's an important difference. Um, so to try and answer your question a little more specifically, I, I didn't think of blood and earth. It's an observation I make about what I do in the sense that I watch what I do and I keep seeing these things occurring and reoccurring. Um, I've got to be reasonably I have been in psychoanalysis for 25 years, so I've got to be reasonably educated about how I reflect on it and say, you know, this is one way to look at it. Um, um, and that mysterious, mediumistic thing that Duchamp's talking about um, can be reflected on as ritualistic, as a, the, the, the ritual performance of a thing. You don't know you're doing it. You can't set out to make a work, just as you can't set out to, you know, what am I going to do? This morning, I'm going to make something beautiful. Or tomorrow, I'm going to make something spiritual. All impossible. Um, and yet, one can stand there and say, you know, beauty's right here, right now, just as political power is right here, right now. Um, 
No good telling me that we'll, you know, be liberated tomorrow. Excuse me, fuck that, you know. Um, but we've got a, it's right here, right now. And I think grabbing that is what, is what we do, what we need to do, it's what we do as artists. Um, we need to insist that, that the immediacy of the act um, is fully fledged. And in watching that, I see that there's blood and there's earth. And, and that they're cosmic, that they connect with something else that seems less explainable. Yeah. What do you do with these massive installations, particularly the site-specific ones? I mean, I saw that cannon with the wax in London, I remember. I, was, I couldn't even see how you could get the wax off the wall. So <laughs> what do you do after you sell them, put them to another museum or the studio? Um, so, you know, amazingly, a couple of those works are in, in museums. Um, um, yep. So, and, and you have amazingly. Versa <laughs> like Versailles, I mean, <laughs> but it's... Um, that work, I have it. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, I don't think one can be directed um, by, the, by just by where's it going to go, what does it cost to do, of course, those are facts. Of course, those are real things um, that we have to, you know, live with. I have to live with. Um, the art world's weird, I must say, because it, it, um, in a way, much, much of the art world is consumed by the object, um, that the object um, is, a, is a commodity of exchange. Um, and, you know, much as my, in my early kind of passage for Marx, this, this thing about the object as a, as a, as a term of exchange. Um, I think what we forget as artists is that, that what we do is worth much more than money. Um, if it really has, if it really can touch something, if it really is human, then it's worth more than money. And I think we, at our peril as artists, we at our peril forget that. So thank, thank you. we have to dare to, to take on whatever. We'll see what happens. Please, sorry, next, next down here, Nicholas, please. But please, yeah. Hi. Um, thank Hi. you for sharing your work. Um, my question is, how does space inform the work? Um, so for example, this piece is also in other places, not just here. Um, how does this, the environment or the context inform the work when it's in a different place? Um, it obviously changes or can change the meaning depending on, 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 on the work. Um, a good work's a good work, irrespective of context. And I, and I know that's probably not what, what one should say, but I do believe it, that a good work's good work. And Maybe, maybe it's true that a work that can bring to itself a whole different set of meanings, um, something, something important about, about that as a, as, a, as a matter of context. So can the context change how and what a thing means? Um, of course it can, of course it does. So can the work allow that is I think what I think I'm trying to say. Can the work take into itself a different context. Please. Um, so the question is, how does a discipline routine um, um, do what? Allows you to, to, to become this medium to... Yeah, I, I can't claim to be a medium. I mean, that, that, let's be clear, please. Um, um, that's Duchamp talking about the artist as a mediumistic being. But, but, um, um, practice. I do believe in the idea of practice. Practice meaning 
that it's every day, it's, I, I don't work weird hours, I do the same thing, you know, wear the same clothes, have the same lunch, et cetera, et cetera, as I said. Um, and I think there's something in the repetitive act, it's like a kind of meditation, um, that in moments or in, with regularity um, can transcend just the act of making. Something else happens if one allows it to happen, if one aspires for it to happen. Um, so there's a wonderful phrase in, in Buddhism which says, all intention misses the mark. I think it's a really beautiful thing. All intention misses the mark. It perhaps is why politics doesn't work. Um, so can an artist act without intention? Um, I think it's worth pondering that. Um, I believe you can, you see. I think practice, the whole idea of practice is that it abandons it intention, at least theoretically. And the point is, how does one get there um, by continual application? Please. Sorry, we have one more here. Uh, Nicholas, please. So color, um, the question is about uh, color uh, in my work and then um, the, the new black. So I'll start with the new black, first of all. The new black is not a paint. It doesn't come out of a tube and it's a process. It's a nano, um, a nano substance. Um, once again, I read a thing in the newspaper uh, about a guy who discovered this incredible black. So I called him up, and he's a, 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 a small company in the south of England. I called him up and said, uh, have you ever thought about using this material aesthetically? Uh, will you let me use it? They said, oh, no, no, no. It's, it's technical. It's used, um, we, we, we developed it for the, the defense industry. It's a stealth material to hide objects. That's exactly what I'm trying to do, hide objects. <laughs> um, so we entered a collaboration. Initially, they could make it little squares this big. We can now make things about that big. My aim is to make them much, much bigger. Um, and it is an extraordinary material. It's, um, um, as I say, nano. So for every meter that it is wide, this material, it's 300 meters tall. So you can imagine, so it's, it's basically put on uh, like a spray and then put into a reactor, mysterious reactor. I don't know what it is, they won't tell me. Um, and so the material's sitting down like this and when it goes in the reactor, it all stands up like that. And these tall trees, meter, meter wide, 300 meters tall, um, stand there and of course they trap the light extraordinary thing about this, though, it's a bit like velvet, if you know what I mean. Um, but that most black paints you look at are black when you look at them at 90 degrees. This stuff is black at any, from any uh, angle. So it means that objects disappear, literally disappear. Um, and it, it's uh, extraordinary, extraordinary stuff. Um, so I really do believe that technology can play a role in, in aesthetic purpose. Um, my deep interest is darkness. So I, you know, I love red because it's not just color. Um, red is color and has um, metaphoric bodily, I've talked about blood, so you know where I'm coming from. But it does a kind of black darkness, a, a kind of black that's better than black. And by the way, blue makes better black than black does. Extraordinarily. Yep. Please. Hi, good evening. How... Sorry, I, I can't. I'm here on the left. Are you right? <laughs> oh, there you are. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> uh, just the lights. I couldn't see you. 
how do you see the sculpture evolving in the context of the digital age? Oh, I'm not very good at the future. Um, but but um, my, my expectation, I, who knows, who knows, but my expectation is that the physical object matters. Uh, since we are physical, we, I think physical interaction is, is, is important and um, will continue to be central in some way. So I believe in it. I believe in the physical object. It, it doesn't, I don't know what, what, what will happen digitally. I've just started to make a work um, a virtual work. Um, but the best one I ever saw was um, um, a button on the side of a virtual street. You, you go into, a, it's a lift, you go into the lift, you go to the top floor, um, and it says plank. And there, even though I'm standing on the floor, I go out and I couldn't walk, I couldn't walk the plank. It was a plank above a city. It's utterly terrifying. So there is something in the virtual world that does have um, physical does have physical implications, but early days. Please. Hi. Could you please talk a little bit about your piece um, exhibited at the Garden of the Peggy Guggenheim Museum in Venice? Oh my gosh. Um, Do you remember what it yeah, is? Yeah, it's a black granite. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know what to say. Um, of course, I've made mirror pieces in many different guises. Um, it's a work that has some, um, that, that um, you know, stone does make wonderful, especially granite, does make wonderful um, mirrored surfaces. So it's working using a piece of stone as a mirror, uh, as a concave mirror. Sorry, that's not very insightful, but there it is. Sure. Hi. Uh, my question is kind of about your background as an artist of Indian descent, and uh, especially earlier on in your career, if that had any implications or factors in uh, kind of the way your work was received and how it influenced how your work which, uh, was made after that as well, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah, um, I think uh, important issue um, in the sense that for me um, in the late 70s, early 80s, it was um, complicated to be uh, artist of Indian origin. I kept being described as an Indian artist and I kept saying I'm not an Indian artist. Um, and it's problematic that because, um, you know, would you ever say to an American artist, are you, it doesn't matter, it's understood, you're an American artist, it's fine. Um, curiously, when you tell someone, at least in that time, it's perhaps, but it, perhaps it's even true now, um, Indian artists, what does that mean? Where does um, um, creativity lie in that equation? Um, I dare to say that some of it, anyway, is given to the background culture. Ah, oh, yeah, but that's... Oops. Um, obviously feel very strongly about it. Um, uh, oh, God. Very, very strongly. <laughs> um, but obviously, I think what happens there is that some degree of that creative impulse is given to the background cultures. That's bloody Indian stuff. You know, I think we have to be very wary of exoticism, of um, um, the ease with which we take it away from certain members of our society, you know, either of ethnic origin or gender or whatever, whatever the so I think we, it's complicated for us to negotiate this. And as artists, we have to fight that pretty hard and drop the bottle all the time. <laughs> sure. Okay. Hi. Um, I have a question. You've, you've talked about um, your process and how the work comes from the process of going 
um, to your studio and doing all these things. And I feel like uh, your work is also very social. So my question is, is there a social component to that process that is important to you in terms of, you know, having the work completed while you're in your studio? Is, is that something that's important? It, it's terribly fashionable nowadays for artists to open art schools and, um, you know, enter into social discourse. I'm very suspicious of it. <laughs> I really am very suspicious of it. Um, Deep practice is personal, alone, complicated. Um, it may well be, though, mm -hmm. that um, it can have social, uh, political, yeah. and other um, um, implications or openings. Um, very difficult, though, at least the kind of person I am, mm -hmm. to go in pursuit of those things and put them right at the center. Um, uh, it's not, sh I'm not sure that there are too, too much ego in the way. Too many things get in the way. Um, the whole point of practice is that it pushes all that, that that's what regularity and um, so on um, is, that it pushes all that stuff out of the way. Um, from, from that perspective, you know, one might think of Picasso and his practice. Whatever one thinks of the work, the practice is absolutely extraordinary. To be able to, you know, be there and do it and do it a whole more than a lifetime of doing it and making I don't know how many however many works he made a day, many 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 works a day, um, as a constant process. There's something in that that is uh, profound and mysterious, um, and uh, you know, I, dare I say that mystery is. Um, um, the deepest of all of these things. How many things have you ever, I mean, how many things have you come across in life that are truly mysterious? It won't be a dozen. It won't be half a dozen. I'd be surprised if it's two or one. Um, and I think to aspire to deep mystery, that's social, deeply social. I mean, I'm sure there are a few things we could all agree on that are profoundly mysterious, remain mysterious, however much you look at them, um, they have this abiding ungraspability. Mm -hmm. um, that's worth aspiring to, it seems to me. Anyway, I talk too much, so please forgive me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.